So the idea behind this lecture is, okay, I have some data. Um, how do I estimate a parametric distribution um, for my data? So we're going to cover um, some of the different methods. We're not going to go over them in detail, but just for your situational awareness that there are different methods out there and they have different um, uses, different applications, and probably different levels of popularity. Um, and then we're going to talk a little more specifically about how to fit a distribution using the maximum likelihood estimation method. And then we'll uh, give an introduction to some of the metrics that we can use to test how well um, the distribution fits our, our data. And then you'll get to do those two things in the exercise. So we'll talk about selecting distributions, fitting them, and then um, assessing how good the fit is. So I touched on this a little bit in the last presentation. So you know, when you're selecting um, distributions, there's lots of different things that can go into informing a decision on that. One is theory. So it's one of those things is what should the distribution be, right? So one example here is that um, the confidence intervals for the exceedance curve or survival function of a normal distribution follow a non-central T distribution, right? So we can we can prove that mathematically that those confidence intervals have the shape of a non-central T. So, you know, if we're trying to model that, then the non-central T would be the obvious choice because it's known to be the correct one. Um, we talked about central limit theorem earlier today, right? Some things for various reasons trend and are more likely to be normal for various reasons related to the central limit theorem. So that might be a reason to, to lean towards a particular distribution. Uh, the other thing to think about is uh, application and sometimes practicality, right? So a PERT distribution um, is a well-behaved distribution, but it's also really simple, right? It only requires three parameters that are really um, amenable to coming up with them through a a subjective expert elicitation process, right? So um, just based on how, how they're being used and, and sometimes for practical reasons, we might pick a particular distribution. Um, others might be standard practice, right? So if you're a coastal engineer, I, I think the Raleigh distribution is one of the ones that's typically used to model wave heights. Um, it also depends on your data, right? So what, what kind of data do you have? Do you have discrete data or continuous data? So we touched that on that earlier with the conversation about, you know, binomial versus Poisson um, and whether or not you want to model things or whether or not your data is discrete or continuous. Talk about the range. So we talked, touched on this earlier, right? Some distributions have bounds. Some are unbounded. So, you know, if you think about is your data or process you're modeling, are values bounded or unbounded? Um, some of these distributions, like a normal distribution, there is a version of the normal distribution um, where you can make it bounded, right? So you can set a lower and an upper bound by modifying uh, the form of the equation. You can you, know, you can find those in, in various literature and online. Um, so there's other options there to kind of uh, adjust some of the distributions you use. And there's different variations of some of these distributions. And then the shape, symmetry, and tail behavior, right? So if we're interested in, ex in extreme events, Right, let's say we're interested, you know, in, in let's say in dam and levee safety, right? We're interested in often in the extreme events, right? Extreme floods, extreme earthquakes. So the what's happening way out in the extremes or what we call the tails of those distributions uh, might be the important thing, right, for a risk analysis. So different distributions may look similar in the center of in the center part of the distribution, but they can look vastly different out in the extremes or the tails. So there might be reasons to, you know, lean towards one distribution over another uh, because its tail behavior is is more consistent with whatever it is you're trying to model. Um, some considerations, other considerations um, for distributions, and especially for fitting them, right? So we have the I, what's commonly called the IID rule of thumb. So you know, data should be independent. And it should all come from the same distribution if we're going to fit it to a distribution. Um, and it also should be stationary over time. So there's lots of techniques that we're not going to cover in this course where um, that you can um, 
adjust for some of these things. So if things aren't identically distributed, maybe you have two different types of faults that generate different earthquakes in some different way, right? You can do things like have mixed distributions, which is beyond the scope of this course, but where you can estimate um, a distribution for each of those generating mechanisms separately and then combine them and end up with a mixed distribution that represents you know, the sum of the parts, so to speak. Um, stationary, there's ways you can, you know, um, adjust for trends over time to get things, um, you know, into, say, uh, data that's representative of, say, present day conditions. So that then, it, you know, for that purpose for estimating the risk this year, it would be considered stationary data. Or you can do, um, there's non stationary um, distribution fitting techniques where you can actually account for the trends. Um, within the fit of the distribution itself. And again, those things are well beyond the scope of this course, but just for your situational awareness. All right, distribution fittings, there's, there's more than what's listed here, but here's four of the more common ones. So method of moments, that might be the classic one that most folks, if you're familiar with any one, any of them, you're probably familiar with this one. Um, that's basically where you estimate the moments of your data so if you have a data set, you would calculate its mean and standard deviation, and then you equate the moments, the sample moments, to the moments of the distribution and, and solve for the distribution parameters. So for a normal distribution, it's really simple, right, because the location is the mean and the, and the scale is the standard deviation. So if you calculate the sample moments, you just plug in the mean and standard deviation for the location and scale, and you get a normal distribution. So that's method moments. Uh, maximum likelihood. Uh, which we'll cover in a little bit more detail, is um, where we de develop a, a likelihood function, which, you know, we'll save the details for when we get to that, and we're trying to maximize it. So we're trying to find the set of parameter estimates that have the highest likelihood of fitting the data, basically, is what we're doing. Um, L moments is another one that's basically linear moments. So it's just another technique to um, equate moments to the parameters of a distribution. Um, it's commonly used for uh, regional analysis. So if you're doing analysis over many sites or data sets, um, L moments is a way to do a regional frequency analysis. Uh, and then Bayesian, which we, we touched on earlier today, Bayesian is another fitting method where you essentially use Bayes' theorem um, instead of using it with discrete probabilities like we did in the example earlier today, you use it with probability distributions. So Bayesian says, um, given my data, what does the probability distribution look like for my parameter estimates? And then in Bayesian analysis, the most likely um, parameter estimates from that distribution become your essentially your best estimate. Um, and then just for notation, this theta is commonly used, you'll see it commonly in the literature, used to denote a parameter set for a distribution. So rather than list every parameter for a distribution, oftentimes you'll see this theta used, and it, it, that just means it's all of the parameters for that particular distribution, whatever they might be, and it's just a kind of a notation shorthand that's commonly used. So what makes a, an estimate a good estimate? Um, and there's there's more things than what's listed here, but these are probably the top four. So what makes a, an estimator a good estimator? So one, it should be unbiased. That means that on average, you're going to get the correct answer for any sample size of data. Um, so, you know, depending, you know, you're going to have sampling error, right? So sometimes you'll be high, sometimes you'll be low. But over the, over the long term, on average, you're going to get the right answer or the right estimate. Um, it's consistent. So what that means is that um, your estimate of the parameter you're estimating should get better as the number of data or the size of your sample gets larger. So if you, as you have more information, your estimate should get better. Um, so that's another good property that not all estimators have, but good ones have. Um, it should be efficient. So efficient, what efficient means is it means you get the smallest amount of variance for your estimate of the parameter sets. So um, different methods, again, over many, many, you know, either real or hypothetical trials, 
um, you'll get different parameter estimates, and those parameter estimates have an, have an uncertainty that we can measure with, it, with their variance. So the idea is to minimize um, the variance in the estimator um, of our parameters. And then the last one is sufficiency, which means we get the biggest uh, bang for our buck, right? So we're deriving as much information as possible from the data that we have. And again, most of the most of the commonly used methods and estimators all have reasonable, reasonably good um, performance uh, across these four um, desirable characteristics of a good estimator. All right, so method of moments. I touched this already. Um, so we basically calculate the the, the mo sample moments of the data, which we talked about yesterday, uh, and um, equate them to the theoretical moments of the distribution. So it's it's simple, it's classic, it's probably what everyone's taught if you took a probability and statistics class. Um, some of the disadvantages is it does tend to have a little bit more bias um, than some of the other methods, and it it doesn't have as good of sufficiency as some of the other methods. So it's it's um, it's not fully taking advantage of the information that's in the data. Uh, maximum likelihood, so you likelihood function, which we'll cover here in a little bit. Um, so you estimate the parameters by finding the parameter set that has the highest likelihood of fitting your data. Uh, it's really good in terms of consistency, um, requires a little bit more math, and it can be sensitive to your initial estimate of the parameters for certain dis for some distributions. And, uh, and again, that's what, one of the reasons why method of moments is usually taught first is because it's it's really simple from a math standpoint. Um, but you'll get into these other methods if you ever take like a, high, a second probability course or a higher level probability course, you'll dive in, into these methods. And we're going to dive into maximum likelihood in the, in the exercise. Um, so what is the likelihood function? So um, generally speaking, the likelihood function comes from three things. One, you have to assume a parametric distribution. So in this example, let's say it's a normal distribution. One is you have to have an assumed or estimated values um, for the parameters, so the theta, right, mean and standard deviation in case of a normal distribution. And then third, you need to know uh, an observed value of your data. So um, what you do then is, given, given that information, given that we've selected a normal distribution and, and that we're testing uh, mean and standard deviation for that normal distribution, the likelihood is just the probability density function uh, from that distribution. So the, if our value is 15 in this example, you know, what's the probability density f of x given x equals 15 for a normal distribution having some uh, specified mean and standard deviation? We do that for each of our data values um, that we have in our, in our sample. And we need to calculate the total or the joint likelihood over all of our data. Um, joint likelihood is, in this case, it's an intersection. So it's a multiplication. So we calculate the likelihood of each individual data value from the density function. So this on the right here, see a plot with hypothetically has a bunch of data values on it. And each one of those has a density corresponding to it. Um, and we do. We estimate that for each data value and then multiply them all out, and that gives us the total likelihood. And what we're trying to do is find out what, what values in, of mean and standard deviation gives, gives us the largest, uh, the largest value for the joint likelihood, because that is the one that is the most likely or the best fit to our data. Um, a little trick then, if you get into doing maximum likelihood, a little trick you need to know is that we Typically in practice, they do the log likelihood. So they take the logarithm of the likelihood function. The reason they do that is because when you're doing the joint likelihood, this product, if you have you know, lots of data, the likelihoods tend to be small numbers. And when you multiply lots of small numbers together, computers get angry. You end up with um, underflow errors where the numbers get too small. Um, so just use an old trick from math class, right, where the log of a product is equal to the sum of the logs. So if we take the logarithm of the likelihood function, we can then just um, sum the logs of the likelihood function 
and we will get the equivalent of having taken the product of the likelihood functions, right? We can get the equivalent answer. Um, the only time you run into a problem is the computers don't like log of zero. Um, so you do have to, if you're, you know, if you're doing this manually, and I think you'll see this in the exercise, you have to basically, if you get a density of zero, in other words, if you're, if you have a data value that's so far out here in the tail that the, the density is essentially zero, then we usually just put a large penalty function, is what they call it. You basically give a number that's, you know, so large that, um, that it doesn't affect the answer at all, right? So that you don't, so that you're not telling the computer to compute log of zero because it'll crash. Um, again, you'll see some of this play out in the in the results. So we use log likelihood just because it makes our computer happy and we don't get underflow errors when we maximize. Um, and again, remember maximum and minima. So the goal is to maximize that likelihood function. There's lots of ways we can do it. Sometimes we can do it analytically. Right, so we can take partial derivatives of the likelihood function with respect to each of the parameters, set that equal to zero, and then solve that system of equations for the values of the parameters. So, you know, in principle, you could do that for some of the simpler distributions, like a normal distribution. Um, but this is what the partial derivative looks like um, just for the mean, and you would have a similar one for the standard deviation. You'd have to set those equal to zero and then solve that system of equations. So um, as an engineer, I, uh, I'm not a big fan of doing this kind of math. So usually um, usually we don't do it this way in practice. And oftentimes for distributions other than the normal distribution, the analytical math gets so cumbersome that it either, either can't be done or it's just not worth the effort unless you really enjoy math. But basically, this plot on the right is a conceptual representation of the likelihood function. Um, the log likelihood function works in the other direction when you take the logarithms. So maximizing the joint likelihood is usually equivalent to minimizing the joint log likelihood. So it ends up becoming essentially a minimum problem. But if this is the likelihood function where the vertical axis would be likelihood and the horizontal would be representative of you know different possible values for your parameters, we're trying to find the minimum of that function, which is the minimum log likelihood, but would correspond to the maximum um, real space likelihood. So the way we usually do it in practice is with some sort of optimization method. Um, so lots of solvers. Excel has some solvers built into it if you've ever used them. If not, you'll get to use one during the exercise. Excels, they, you know, they're not super robust, but, you know, they work a lot of the times. Um, other software has much, you know, there's other software packages out there have much better solvers, but for purposes of the exercise today, it should work pretty well. Um, but you just let the computer do the work. And it's, you know, most of these solvers work off some kind of search routine, right, where it makes a guess. And then, you know, based on the results of that guess, it tries to make a new guess, right, and it eventually hones in on, on the minimum through a, through a series of, you know, kind of some sort of guess and check procedure, and there's lots of different um, ways to do that. Some are faster and more efficient than others. Um, OK, so circling back to L moments. So um, again, L moments, L means linear, so it's a linear combination of the order statistics for your data. The big advantage, as I mentioned before, is it's really good for doing regional analysis. So um, when we're trying to expand our data sets in space by doing analysis over a region, it's, it's a pretty powerful tool there. And it's, um, it, it, um, it's pretty resistant to the ill effects you can sometimes get if you have lots of outliers in your data, so it's pretty robust there. But again, more math involved. And then Bayes and I talked about use Bayes theorem. Again, same concept, right? What's, what's my estimated distribution of my parameters um, that I'm fitting given the data that I have? So the big disadvantage is computation burden. You know, prior to, I don't know, probably 20 years ago, Bayesian was rarely used because of the uh, computation power it required, and which some might say is one of the reasons Bayesian um, historically hasn't been very popular, hasn't been taught a lot in standard probability and statistics courses. 
Um, but there's been a resurgence in Bayesian methods, and now in a lot of a lot of fields, it's actually the preferred method and preferred approach um, because um, computers have and algorithms have gotten fast enough that um, computation burden is no longer a, no longer a challenge for us. So, uh, like I said, in a, in a lot of fields, this is now one of the preferred um, methods. And again, just a, this is a visual base theorem as it works uh, when you're dealing with distributions, right? So you have some prior prior estimate here. Um, let me go back. So prior estimate of your parameters, so same as the prior probability we saw earlier today. So now it's a distribution for each of your parameters. Um, this is your data, right? So given the data I've observed, I calculate the likelihood of the data, just like you do in maximum likelihood estimation. Um, you have the similar concept of a normalizing constant in the denominator. And again, this just makes sure that Bayes' theorem works out so that um, on the left-hand side, you get valid probability. So that's the big difference, or one of the differences between maximum likelihood and, and probabilities is when you calculate the likelihood function, likelihoods are not probabilities. But when you put them into Bayes' theorem and, and apply Bayes' theorem correctly with this normalizing constant, you can, in a sense, convert them to proper probability estimates. Um, so out of that, you get a probability distribution from your, uh, uh, for your parameter estimates given the data that you have, and that can be translated into um, all the goodies we get from frequency curves, right? A, a most likely or, or posterior mode estimate, a mean estimate of our frequency curve. This is kind of an example for a flood hazard curve, but the mean estimate, which in the Bayesian world is called the posterior predictive distribution, and then you can get the credible intervals which is a, an estimate of the uncertainty. And then you can portray Bayesian results lots of different ways. This is a common way you'll see them portrayed. This is for a three-parameter distribution. So think of this like a, as like a matrix um, that shows the relationship uh, amongst the three parameters. So the, the kind of pink-looking distributions are the marginal distributions for each of the individual parameters for the, dis, for the distribution. And then um, these kind of heat map plots are pairwise um, joint distributions uh, for pairs of parameters, right? So this is mean in the upper left, standard deviation in the middle, and skew in the bottom right. And then this first uh, first heat map here is the joint distribution of mean and standard deviation. Bottom left is joint of mean and skew. And the bottom right heat map is the joint distribution of uh, skew and standard deviation. So you can kind of see how the parameters might be um, related and correlated with each other or perhaps not correlated with each other. So an observation, this is, a, again, this is a flood frequency example, but for, for log Pearson type 3 distribution, one, one common uh, characteristic of the log Pearson 3 distribution is that um, skew is um, negatively correlated with standard deviation. So as as standard deviation goes up, right, so in this bottom right heat map, as you move to the right and standard deviation gets higher, the skew will um, go down, it will decrease. So you get this um, heat map that has uh, kind of a diagonal um, feel to it. Um, so anyway, you can, again, use plots like this to make different inferences about your distribution and the parameters. All right, so now we'll cover goodness of fit. So these are to some of the many metrics we can use to judge how well um, our choice of distribution fits our data. So uh, I'll probably mispronounce some of these, but the, the Akaki Information Criteria, or AIC, uh, Bayesian Information Criteria, Root Mean Square Error, Chi-Squared, Kamelgraf Smirnoff Test, and Anderson Darling, and there's many others. So this is just to give you a, just a, a snippet and a flavor for these things. So the AIC is a relative measure um, it does give a penalty based on the number of parameters to discourage overfitting. So overfitting is basically if you put enough parameters in your model, you'll get a perfect fit, right? So if you've ever done like a, if you ever do like a polynomial fit to a set of data, well, if you just make the, the number of, um, if you just make the order of your polynomial fit really high, right, you'll get a perfect fit. Well, that's overfitting because that's not really a good practice. That's not really what your data 
uh, it's not really representative of your actual data. So there's a penalty in there for number of parameters. Smaller values better. Um, the two main inputs are the number of distribution parameters and your estimate of the maximum likelihood and your sample size. And you'll get to calculate a couple of these in the in the um, in the exercise. Um, BIC Bayesian information criteria is very similar relative. There's a penalty. Smaller is better. Um, the inputs are the number of parameters, the likelihood, and the sample size. Um, root mean square error. So this is this is maybe one some of you may be somewhat familiar with. So this is the square root of the variance of the residuals. So this basically is a measure of how close is my observed data to my fitted distribution. Again, smaller is better, and the inputs to that are the sample size, um, the value that you would have predicted from your fitted distribution versus the actual value that you observed from your data. So you take the difference from those, square it. The reason you square it is so that um, positive and negative errors don't cancel each other. Um, and then you divide by the total number of data, which is essentially the average, right? That's why it's called mean square error, so the average error. And then you take the square root of it, right? Which is why it's called root mean square. Um, Anderson Darling depends on the specific distribution you're using. Um, but the general formula here is um, there's this A squared parameter um, that you have to calculate. Um, and this S value. So um, the inputs to this are um, basically you have to select a significance level um, and a critical, uh, and then you'll get a critical p value depending on what your distribution is. And what you want to do is compare your results to the p value. And you'll get to see this. So uh, one of the things to remember with these, all these types of tests, particularly these, these ones that are statistical tests, doesn't necessarily tell you whether or not you have a normal distribution. It only tells you whether or not the data makes it likely or unlikely that it fits the distribution based on what significance level you picked. And we'll go into that a little bit deeper when we talk about hypothesis testing, which I think is on the agenda um, for tomorrow. OK, that ends that lecture. Um, so there, uh, anything in the chat? There's, uh, there was one question here about the T distribution. Uh, I'm not sure if there's anything specific that you had in mind. Um, I will say that you know there's a. I, I'm not sure if I have a copy of it. There's a famous paper that um, that derived and proposed the. Um, the non-central T distribution and also related to that the student T distribution. Um, and I think if I remember correctly, I'm not sure if this is true or urban legend, but the related distribution to the non-central T is student T, which um, got its name because the person that wrote the original paper did it under a pseudonym. And I think they just used student as their pseudonym. So it became known as the student T distribution. So. That's a fun fact that I can't promise is true, but I think I've heard or read that somewhere. The other thing about the T distribution, you'll see that um, it's the non-central T distribution. You know, it's a function of the degrees of freedom. And as the number of degrees of freedom gets large, um, It will, um, in the limit, converge to a normal distribution. So what you will see in um, when you look at these confidence intervals, so the example I gave were you know, the confidence intervals of a normal distribution um, on the survival function of a normal distribution are non-central t. But if your sample size gets really large, they basically become normal. So in the limit, um, those confidence intervals are normally distributed. So distribution fitting. So, um, so I think this is the same data from the first exercise. I think it's the same precipitation data. Maybe not. I'm not 100 percent sure. But I think it might be. Um, so the idea is to is to fit that data to an appropriate parametric probability distribution um, so that we can model it in a risk analysis. 
the data is in the provided spreadsheet. Um, first step is just to do some basic exploration of the data, and um, and and do some some just some plotting of the data. Um, again, this is something you always want to get in the habit of doing with data is checking for this IID um, rule of thumb, right, and making sure that. Um, and really, three things. It's really IID and stationarity, right? So you want to make sure your data is um, independent, identically distributed, and, and reasonably stationary. Um, so this first step is really just to kind of do those checks of your data. Um, second thing is to estimate, um, or, or sorry, fit the fit the data to a normal distribution using the maximum likelihood method. And there's a couple other steps in there to plot a um, a um, the uh, empirical cumulative distribution function. That's another good practice, right? When you're fitting data, is to compare the fit um, visually to the empirical distribution uh, of your data, um, and then it walks through all the procedures and formulas. And again, some of these, you know, some of the functions in Excel, you just got to know some of the tricks in the trade, tricks of the trade to get some of these calculations to work in Excel. You might know of other tricks that I'm not aware of. So if you know of other tricks, like feel free to do it however you like. But um, what's presented in the directions here should work. So the idea here is to put in a, a, an initial guess for the parameters, um, look at the calculated likelihood, and then based on that likelihood, make a second guess um, and see if your second guess has a um, better likelihood, higher likelihood value than the first guess, right? See if you can just manually uh, walk through a couple guesses, right, and see if you can kind of hone in, you know, start to hone in on the answer. And then after you've done a couple guesses, you'll let the, you'll let Excel um, optimize the solution for you and find the right answer. So you'll use the Excel solver. Um, yeah, and then, uh, the second piece is to do some similar things for a different distribution. So this will be a Gumball distribution, which is also known as an extreme value type one distribution. Again, using maximum likelihood. And then the last task will be um, to calculate some of these goodness of fit metrics. And then based on their values, um, make a recommendation on which distribution is a better fit to the data based on those metrics. Um, I think there might be a typo in the instructions step here where it has the um, formula to do the um, log likelihood function. I think the, the it's missing this LN for the natural log term in here. So if you ran into that issue, um, the correct version of this should have a natural log here in front of the in front of the norm distribution statement. So just to clarify that typo there so you don't get stuck uh, as you're going through the exercise, thanks. So in this exercise, this exercise was about um, fitting probability distributions to uh, observe data. In this case, the exercise, it was a, a time series of annual maximum um, or sorry, of uh, total annual precipitation. So the total precipitation over the entire um, calendar year uh, for each year of the period of record. So to kick things off, just uh, kind of refresh and, and get some more practice. We asked, um, asked you to do some of the standard plots again to check some of the things we should be checking when we're doing these types of analyses, especially with time series data. So time series plot, um, just to simply visual, visually look for any trends either in, um, in the typical or mean value, is it increasing, decreasing, or staying about the same, and uh, looking for any trends in, um, in variance, is the variability of the data increasing, decreasing, or staying about the same. So that's this first plot here, and again, it's just simply the plotting the years in order versus the, the values. Um, and then we did a lag, lag one plot just to check for autocorrelation because we want each, um, each year to be independent of other years when we're doing uh, distribution fitting for this type of application. So again, you did this before, I think in the, in the previous exercise, just, you can just copy this data 
And then um, since the years are in ascending order or increasing order, you want to essentially when you paste it, just um, drop it down one row and that'll give you the lag one values. And then you can simply just plot those, um, those two columns here. Um, and then for lag, for these lag plots, it's useful to have the one to one line on here. So again, you can do it however you like. I do it with just two points and add a line feature in Excel on the chart. Um, so you can just get a visual for how much scatter you have about that one double one line. And again, remember more scatter is better and as the correlation coefficient count goes up, um, things again will coalesce closer to that line. Um, and again, as I mentioned previously, sometimes that's tricky on the visual. So um, you can also calculate the actual correlation coefficient of the data and the lag one data. Um, and Excel has a built-in function for that. Um, and when you do that, that'll actually give you a, a more quantitative measure. And again, remember correlation near zero is good. It means there's no autocorrelation in the data, which means each year is independent of the previous year. And when you have um, correlations that approach plus one, that's positive correlation and approaching negative one is um, negative correlation. Uh, comment in the chat. There's a couple comments or questions about the plots. Go ahead. Yes, thanks very much. Uh, they're, they're really comments. Uh, one is on the time series. I tend to connect those dots because it's time and it gives me a, a better feel. It's not really a scatter plot. It's a time trend. So I do connect those dots and then with a line. And the other yeah, thing sure. is that for, uh, for visualization of the lag plot, um, I adjusted the graph on my screen so that X and Y are approximately equal, and it gives a um, what, well, it's it's a more faithful, it seems, presentation of the data because it's uh, e a nearly equal dimensional across the trend line, whereas yours is skewed, but it's only because of the axis. Uh, so you're suggesting some. Well, let me have to yeah, yeah, you, you can see. So and, something more like that. Yeah, and I had the X and the Y intervals the same so that each box then as it gets close to a square, it's very easy, easy to do visually. Yep. So, so just minor comments, but I'm a visual learner and so I pay attention to that. Yeah, no, I'm with you, I'm with you. That's, I think that's a really good, really good, uh, really good improvement. So yeah, so, so you can, uh, oops, yeah, you grab the plot, not the whole graphic, just inside the graph. No, not that. You know, click on. Uh, yeah, either way, or you can grab this one. Yeah, yeah, there. That's how you adjust the axis. Yep. There you go. Right, right. Good. Yeah, and just visually adjust it till they're roughly square, right? Which means they're proportional or the same. Sorry, same dimension. Yeah. Yeah, that's a or, huge drawback to Excel plotting. It's not made for graphics. Yeah. So I yeah, use no, Sigma so plot for this. Yeah, yeah, yep. Okay, so there you go. So there's, yeah, good suggestion. One is the, if you put the lines here with the points, if there's a, if there's a trend, you'll, you might see it more readily. And then, and also the scatter too, you might see it more readily. And then, yeah, squaring this up um, so that the aspect ratio is the same on both axes uh, will help with the visual interpretation of it. Yep, definitely. Okay, so those are the plots, and again, correlation coefficients pretty small, so this data is um, unlikely to have any autocorrelation concerns with it. Um, okay, so the first question was based on your visual inspection. You know, are there any concerns that we might be violating the independent and identically distributed assumption for fitting a distribution of this data? And the answer is probably not. Um, Next step was to use maximum likelihood estimation to fit uh, or estimate parameters, uh, assuming we're trying to fit a normal distribution to this data. So a normal distribution has, um, has two parameters, mean and standard deviation, which for a normal are the same thing as the location in the scale. Um, so the data was given here, um, the, east, uh, the empirical um, cumulative distribution plot, I 
think was given to you here. Um, so again, that's just another another way and another opportunity that when you start fitting distribution, you can visually compare it to where the where the um, empirical percentiles plot um, for your for your data set. And then the idea here was to um, just initially make a guess, right? Just look look at the data and look where things plot and make a guess. So, you know, depending on what you thought was a good guess, you know, something probably in the ballpark of 12 for the mean and around four for standard deviation would have probably been a, a good initial guess. So if you made that initial guess, right, and then you can look at this total, um, total log likelihood um, estimate. Um, I guess before that you had to enter the formula for log likelihood. Um, I think there was a typo. Uh, someone caught it yesterday. There was a typo in the um, in the instructions. So apologies for that. Um, this little ln here for the natural logarithm was missing in the um, instructions. So remember from yesterday, right? We want the likelihood, which for uh, an exact observed data value, which all of these data are, it's just the probability density function for the distribution you're fitting, um, given your estimate of the parameters. So to calculate that in Excel, it's just norm.dist. The DIST versions of probability distributions, again, remember in Excel, is um, you give it um, the value of the variable and it will return um, uh, the density. So norm.dist, so you enter the, the data value, um, the mean and standard deviation, that was your guess. And then Excel also in the DIST function has two options, uh, true or false. True will return the cumulative um, distribution function, the CDF. False will return the, the density function or the, or the PDF. So we want the probability density, which is the likelihood. So we have a false in here. And then we take the natural logarithm of that so we're not dealing with multiplying lots of small numbers. And then this if error thing is just a way to manage um, scenarios where you could potentially get a uh, density value of zero. And if you do that and try to take the natural log of it, um, Excel and any, any piece of software will return an error. So this is just an error management thing. So if, if error just says, if the formula I'm calculating uh, blows up in Excel, then I can tell it over here to the right of this comma is the second argument, right? I can tell it what to do, right? Or what value to assign. So if it if it blows up, if there's an error, if I get a natural log of zero, I'm going to use this, what we call penalty function. So it's basically, I'm just going to put a very large negative number in there so that it has um, practically no effect on the analysis, right? Um, Okay, so you do that for each cell here for each data value. And then um, since we're normally the likely maximum likelihood is, is the joint likelihood, we would take the product. But since we're doing the log, the log converts that to a sum. So in this case, we're summing um, all these likelihood values in column H. And the goal is to maximize um, that value. So these are these are negative. These will come out to be negative in terms of the log likelihood. So Sometimes it's easy, at least for me, you get tripped up on remembering that when you're maximizing and you're working and, and the numbers are in the negative side of the number scale. Um, kind of the larger, I guess, absolute value, if you will, right, is um, on the negative scale is actually a smaller number and the, a value that has a smaller absolute value is actually the larger number, right? So. Um, it's kind of, at least for me, it's a little bit intuitively backwards. So that's one thing to remember when you're looking at these, especially when the log likelihood comes out negative. So that's your log likelihood. And then the idea here was to just, you know, make another guess and see if you can improve your guess um, and see if your log likelihood goes up. And in this case, if you change your guess to 12 and a half and four and a half, it goes up a little bit. Um, and you can, you can visually see how things compare. So if I put like a, I don't know if I put a, obviously, far off number here, if I put 10, right, or eight for the standard deviation, you can see that the fit is, starts to get poor relative to the data, right? 
So you can do this somewhat manually and visually, and then to get the to get the actual maximum likelihood, right? We let the computer do the rest of the work so that in Excel we can use the solver um, to uh, find the actual um, the actual maximum for us. So that was in the exercise. And if you if you did that, um, you should get something on the order of. something in the ballpark of 12.75 and 4.28. And that value, if you check it and compare it to your first two guesses, right, this value should be um, a larger value, higher likelihood um, than your first two guesses. And again, different search routines, work different ways right but you know some of them are, are working off of a guess and then they take a kind of a slope at the guess and decide what direction to go and how far to go for the next guess right and eventually it find hones in on the point where the um where there's no where the, where the slope essentially goes to zero right which tells you that you've found either the maximum or the minimum and uh, again excel is excel is okay you know the solvers are okay but again as uh, Jeff mentioned earlier, it's, you know, Excel is uh, fundamentally, it's not a engineering or statistical software package. So uh, there are packages out there that have much better, more efficient um, solvers out there. But for simple problems like this, Excel will work just fine. And then the idea here was to calculate the cumulative distribution function, the CDF, or your normal distribution um, over over a, a range of X's that span your data. This is just so you could do this visual visual comparison, right? So it's again norm dot dis function with the um, the given X value, and then your guess for mean and standard deviation. And this time, instead of false, we want true because we want uh, in Excel the convention is true is the CDF or cumulative distribution function. So this this column here just gives you this plot of this orange line for comparison. Again, it's just a visual comparison. I remember these, you know, these um, these points that represent your data and the, um, the empirical CDF values that go with them have uncertainty. And especially when you're at the either end on the, on the tails of the data, so the highest few values and the lowest few values, um, the uncertainty can actually be quite large. So um, keep that in mind that, you know, this is just a kind of a visual indicator, but it's not a guarantee that you have a good fit. Okay, uh, that was that part. Uh, any questions on that part? Okay, next part was to do the exact same thing um, with the Gumball distribution. I think most of the most of the um, most of since they're since it's essentially the same process. Most of the inputs were already pre-prepared for you and provided to you. Um, really the only difference here in this formula is, uh, for the likelihood function is this equation here. So when you're doing this for different, um, different parametric distributions, the setup will be entirely the same for, for pretty much any distribution except for this part of the log of the likelihood formula. And what you want to plug in here is the um, equation for the density function for whatever distribution it is you're trying to fit. All right, so in the previous one, it was norm.dist for the normal distribution. In this one, Excel doesn't have any built-in functions for a Gumbel distribution. So um, this is this is what the um, probability density function equation looks like for a Gumbel distribution. But like I said, this will work with um, with pretty much any distribution that has a, a parametric function for its PDF. You just plug it in here and, uh, and you can fit other types of distributions. So the rest is all the same. Again, use, you know, you have to make an initial guess. Um, generally with these types of methods, um, you have to start with a guess, and depending on how good the solver is, you know, your guess has to be in the ballpark. Um, and then run the solver, and it should converge to 
the solution. And for Gumball, the parameters are location and scale, two parameters. So these you should, get, you should have gotten something like this, 10.77, 3.32 if you round it. Um, okay, and then, so that was that piece. And then um, the next piece was to do some of the goodness of fit metrics that we covered yesterday. And these are just a few of many that are available and compare them for each of the two fits, and then based on the results of that, um, suggest which one might be a better fit based on those particular metrics. So for the, um, for both the normal and the gumball, the, the, um, the formulas are basically the same. They were, they were provided yesterday. Remember, they're a function of the number of data, the number of parameters, um, and the um, total, of the log uh, or total likelihood. Um, so if you plug those in into the two formulas, you get uh, for the normal uh, 176.9, 179.2 for the AIC and the BIC. And then you had to calculate the root mean square error. So again, there's depending on how you like to set these up on this one, I, I like to set it up by doing the residuals first. So the residual is basically the um, the theoretical value from the fitted distribution minus the observed value. So in this case, we're using the norm inverse function um, to get what the value would be from our fitted distribution and subtracting from that the observed value. And then the root mean square error is the square root of the sum of the squares of the residuals, right? So in Excel, Excel has a few functions that help us to do that. Um, so we want to square the residuals and then sum them. So XO has a formula that'll, that'll do that in one step for you called sum square. So it's S-U-M-S-Q. Again, you could do each step one at a time if you prefer. Either way will work. Um, we want the average of that. So we divide by the, the total number of data. So however you like to do that, count will work in Excel uh, as a function. And then we want the square root of that, which is obviously just SQRT in Excel. So you get that value. And then same thing for the um, gumbo distribution, those values were calculated for you. So we have AIC of 172, BIC of 174, and root mean square 0.83. And the idea was to kind of uh, suggest which one uh, was the best. And remember for, for all three of these particular metrics, smaller value indicates a better fit to your data. So in this case, um, it looks like the Gumbel distribution had better metrics across all three of these measures, right? So the AIC, the BIC, and the root mean square error were all smaller for Gumbel. So that's an indication that um, Gumbel might be a better choice than normal for this particular data set. Now, you, you know, again, this is not definitive, you know, doesn't guarantee that it's a better fit. And sometimes you will get, um, you won't always get all the metrics won't always give you the same indication, right? You can have cases where, you know, one or two of the metrics suggest that one of the distributions is better and, you know, another metric suggests another one's better. So at, at the end of the day, um, you still have to apply some some judgment, right, to, to your final selection. Don't rely solely on the metrics to make the decision for you. Um, make sure you're um, still applying your, your expertise and judgment when you're selecting the one you want to use. And then the last thing was um, Anderson Darling, and we'll get into this in a little more depth today when we go over hypothesis testing. Um, this kind of leads into some of that. So Anderson Darling test is just one one of, of many different tests. Um, so the idea here is we can pick a significance level. Uh, Five percent is pretty standard, and then specific to the. Um, Anderson Darling is specific to the. To the distribution right so you have to either have a way to calculate or look up um, the the um, test um, value um, which in this case is uh, calculated here for you and again this is just to show you a demonstration of how these types of things can be calculated um, and then the idea is if the um, if at least for this particular test if this a squared value is um, greater than your p-value, 
then um, you would want to reject your your null hypothesis if it's less than you want to um, not reject it. So in this case, we had a, a squared of 0.67. Um, the critical p-value given an alpha of 5% is 0.76 for an Anderson-Darling test with a normal distribution. And so because this a square valued is less than the uh, critical p-value, um, we are not going to reject our null hypothesis. So that means um, our null hypothesis is that the data is normally distributed. So since we're not rejecting it, um, we can, um, you know, it's it's uh, that test would suggest that um, the data might be normally distributed, right? And again, these tests aren't guarantees, right? They're just statistical tests, but based on uh, the criteria we chose for this test, um, a normal distribution would not be a bad choice for this particular uh, set of data. And again, that p-value for this particular test, right, it depends on your alpha, your 5% significant level, and the distribution. So there's different, um, in some cases, formulas, in a lot of cases, tables to look up what the critical p-value is. Okay, that's everything for the exercise.